uh, this is really probably setting the stage more for their uh, networking session where you'll have an opportunity to speak with them in depth should you choose to. But uh, um, I've given them each a, a short uh, amount of time to introduce themselves, their company, uh, what, the, what they want to say. Um, that'll eat up most of our 45 minutes, but if we have some time at the end, I would like some question and answer from you if you have. So um, I don't know everybody. I did at one point, but we've got some new, new people up here, so some of which I just met in the last couple of days. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves to you, and we'll just start at this end. And Sure, if you could pull up the charts for Hopkins, please, in the back there. So I'm Josh Hopkins from Lockheed Martin. I am one of our mission leads for our McCandless Lunar Lander, which is the Lockheed Martin service in CLIPS. We have a long history of working in the planetary science community, but I wanted to throw some examples up on the screen because not everybody uh, is familiar with us. We're typically working behind the scenes supporting NASA and JPL, but we've worked on a couple of dozen planetary missions over the years. Our role generally spans anywhere from helping to conceive the mission, write the proposal, design the spacecraft, build the spacecraft, test it, and even operate it um, during flight. There was some discussion uh, yesterday to the effect that um, new potential PIs don't necessarily know where to start to, to start pulling together a team to propose to a competed PI-led mission. I'd like to offer the suggestion that feel free to call Lockheed Martin. We have a pretty good track record of working with PIs to put together winning uh, proposals and missions. Um, I won't try to describe all of the missions on the chart there, but I do want to point out a couple. One of them is Lunar Prospector, which I mentioned because it's lunar, but also because it was one of the first missions I worked on. So I have a, a soft spot in my heart for it. Also the Grail orbiters. So we've had three Lockheed Martin spacecraft at the moon in about the last 20 years. And then also, of course, our Mars landers. So beginning all the way back with Viking, more recently with Phoenix and InSight. And the photo on the right is a photo of InSight. I chose that particular photo because you can see a pretty good view of the landing legs and the descent thrusters, which are two of the aspects of InSight and Phoenix that we are bringing forward to our McCandless lunar lander. Let's see, I bet one of these is the clicker. There we go. So here's what our lander looks like. Um, it is a medium class lander. We didn't grow out of the Google Lunar X Prize. We've sort of evolved from a very science focused um, history. So we wanted a lander that can support some fairly complex and sophisticated lunar missions, such as ISRU pilot plants. Or for example, if hypothetically you wanted to deploy a polar resource prospecting rover that was fairly large, Having, having a large lander with a low deck uh, would be pretty handy. Uh, there are a number of specifications there. Don't bother trying to write them all down because at the bottom is the link to our user's guide, which is available on the web. And if you don't feel like even writing down the URL for the user's guide, pick up one of the stickers from our table that has the specs and the URL for the guide on the back. But just to highlight a few key points, we can carry up to about 350 kilograms. Um, as Clive mentioned earlier, power is very important. We've designed a large solar array for large payload power that is gimbaled so it can track the sun. That means we can land early in the lunar day, provide you a lot of power all through the day uh, into the evening. We have been focusing on precision landing capability. We've also been doing some work on how to survive the lunar night. Both of those are sort of enhanced upgrade features, not necessarily in the base model but we're very interested in talking to you if you have mission needs along those lines. Um, I'd also point out that we've designed this for fairly robust landing capabilities. So we have pretty high ground clearance and we're able to handle uh, fairly large size uh, variations in the terrain. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next chart, which is just a picture of the user's guide and a reminder that you're welcome to download that if you have any additional questions. And I'll be in the back. I think I'm in the back and on the right in the networking session after this talk. Thanks. Uh, I'm Will Coogan with Firefly Aerospace. If you can get those slides up, please. Uh, so you may recognize that lander is the one that's in the back of the room right now. 
A quick overview on who we are at Firefly. We are located in the Austin, Texas area. We have about 300 employees at, at present, about 200 of which are in the Austin area. Uh, that area includes both our R&D facility as well as a 200 acre test site. Uh, until about a year and a half ago, we were working exclusively on our Alpha launch vehicle, uh, which you can see pictured in uh, several components there. Um, that vehicle is capable of delivering about a thousand kilograms to low Earth orbit, so it's a, a small lift launch vehicle. Uh, also pictured is our Vandenberg Air Force Base launch site. We have a second launch site out at Cape Canaveral, um, and we're presently planning on the first launch of that vehicle in first quarter of next year. Starting about a year and a half ago, uh, in addition to working on this launch vehicle, uh, we decided to uh, compete for the, the Eclipse missions. Uh, so I said we're working on a small lift launch vehicle. Uh, we're also working now on a small lander. We've actually licensed the intellectual property for the uh, bear sheet lander, uh, which as many of you know, uh, was launched in February of this year. Uh, so just quick overview of that mission. Uh, on the left there, you can see the the bear sheet lander being integrated for uh, ride share on a Falcon 9. Uh, you can see uh, top center, a uh, selfie that it took above the lunar surface, followed below by the final picture the lander took at 15 kilometers above the lunar surface, uh, after which uh, tardigrades commandeered the vehicle and crashed into the lunar surface. Um, <laughs> maybe too soon. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, obvi obviously the, the lander did not succeed uh, in achieving a soft touchdown. Came in about a kilometer per second faster than we'd hoped. Uh, also, uh, a little close to the deadline for the last mission task order. Um, but we've done a full failure analysis now. Um, IEI has gone through it. We agree with their results, and we are very confident that that will not happen again. Um, so what are we doing going forward? Uh, we have most of this table on a pamphlet that's just outside the, the door there, I think right next to the, the Draper table outside the door. Uh, what I want to make clear though is that what we're advertising right now is an as-is capability. Uh, we would like to leverage our, our heritage as, as much as we possibly can. Uh, we do have a number, number of growth paths to uh, higher data services, to higher payload capacity. Um, we're interested in exploring those if necessary, but if possible, we would like to leverage this, this small vehicle. Uh, we think there are advantages to being small. Uh, we think, uh, you know, we've heard from a lot of you over the last couple of days uh, that you would like to be in many different places all over the moon. And we think, you know, there's an advantage to being large where you get a lower cost per kilogram, but there's also an advantage to being small where you can get a, uh, I'm sorry, a smaller cost per kilogram. If you have a small vehicle, you can also get a smaller cost per mission. And that's really where we think the, the niche for this vehicle is. And that's it for us. Thank you. Luckily, they don't want to reintroduce themselves. Uh, if you could pull up the Mastin slides, that'd be great. I'm Sean Mahoney from Mastin Space Systems. A, a year ago, I waxed poetic uh, doing a combination of, you know, spring is coming to the moon, using a kind of Game of Thrones reference. I think the moon has had a better year than Game of Thrones has, so <clears throat> we have that going for us. Um, what I wanted to do in this kind of brief overview is instead of focusing on the specific architecture that we're using for going to the moon, I want to talk about the approach that might be a little different uh, and, and that primarily is that we are working with you, not in future tense, but in all tense, in, in the past, right now, and in the future. So we have been Actually, we are the reigning X Prize champ because there was no final winner of the Google Winner X Prize. And the one before that, now, and I've been rounding up for the better part of the year, saying 10 years ago, we're now over 10 years from the Lunar Lander Challenge. So until someone else wins a Space X Prize, we get to claim it was only a million dollars, but it was something that was definitely done. And I, if I click this, let's see if that's going to play. The, uh, and so this is going to have just some images you're probably familiar with about what Mastin has been doing. But 
The important part here is not just, hey, we've got the technology that flies. The important part is you're gonna see some other names that show up across the bottom here. These are the people that we have been working with. Several of the payloads that have been selected to go to the moon have already done their risk mitigation with Mastin. Several of the payloads that have been proposed are being developed. And to make sure that I understand what your world is like, we actually submitted a series of proposals in to the proposal process. We have scientists as members of our broader team to make sure that we understand the world that you live in. So here is the challenge and the opportunity for you. Whether you're flying with us to the moon or any of the other folks that are up here and whether you're doing your testing and development with Mastin or any of the other providers that can provide terrestrial service, change the pace of space development, avail yourselves of a different approach to making space available and do that now. Don't wait until your system is fully developed and tested out. Go get testing, develop it in conjunction with folks, either you know, the people that are up here or the other companies that can offer integrated development and testing, because that's what's gonna allow you to move very quickly and take advantage of this opportunity that is these next couple of years. If you're not already familiar with the company, we've built and flown a bunch of vehicles. We've got an architecture that can handle anything from zero kilograms, if you want us to fly an algorithm, uh, all the way up 100 kilogram, 500 kilogram, one and a half metric tons. It's all in that development pipeline. And we're more than happy to talk to you about how we can adapt our solution to make sure it's meeting the requirements that you have. And obviously we're gonna to try to find the right, the right knee in the cost curve. So uh, myself, Matt Coons, our chief engineer and Tristan Sembrinsky, our business development and partnership manager will be outside happy to talk to you about what Mastin can do to help you develop the systems that are heading to the moon. Thank you. I'm Steve Bailey from Deep Space Systems. Uh, we're a, a group of about 60 that are in Littleton, Colorado, kind of overachievers from NASA, JPL, and uh, ex Lockheed Martin, um, working Yeah. So our uh, first offering for CLIPS is a uh, 100 kilogram class lander that also has a optional mobility package. Uh, the mobility package is designed kind of around the LRV. It's the same kind of footprint, field diameter, same level of mobility. Uh, for the Apollo uh, 16 crew, they were able to get to speeds that if uh, they had been sustained, they would have been able to drive around the, room, the moon staying in sunlight uh, the entire time. Uh, this rover uh, would have a maximum speed capability of about five kilometers per hour, uh, but at, and at the uh, near the lunar pole, if you can make about one kilometer per hour, then you can do that Magellan Traverse and stay in the sunlight the whole time. So that's kind of a uh, maybe a better way to <laughs> Uh, avoid nighttime completely is just by staying in the sunlight. And so the uh, the specs for this lander and also the specs for uh, the other lander I'll show are on our website and there's a full user's guide uh, for, for both. This shows the uh, lander in uh, perspective. Uh, it's a very simple system. This is designed to single tank monopropellant um, deliver small payloads anywhere on the moon. Uh, polar locations were uh, preferred for us, but it's also configurable for uh, any latitude. So super simple, super high heritage, very much heritage to the uh, Mars landers uh, that uh, our teams have worked exten extensively on. All of the uh, 
design is complete, we're past a PDR stage, uh, somewhere between PDR and CDR. Uh, we have a hardware in the test, hardware in the loop test bed that is uh, fully operational. Um, so our lander in its virtual reality world dreams it's flying and is landing many, many uh, missions. So the uh, saddlebag payload locations can accommodate up to uh, 20 kilograms if we're on a GTO mission or 50 kilograms if we're uh, thrown to TLI or up to 70 kilograms if we take the long road and do a weak uh, stability boundary type trajectory. The uh, configuration as uh, ESPA uh, secondary payload. So for any mission going to geo uh, synchronous orbit, we can hitch a ride. Uh, this shows two different, uh, two landers. But our real objective with the lander in this class is to do a network mission. So um, with eight landers on a single launch or four successive launches of pairs of landers, any kind of combination like that, anything that's going to uh, GEO or to TLI uh, gives us an opportunity to build out uh, that network. And so we found that 20 kilograms is kind of the sweet spot for uh, payloads that would include things like seismometer, uh, of course, laser retroflector, um, magnetometer, spectrometer, uh, these kind of standard uh, instruments that take into global sites uh, will provide that kind of next step of uh, in the uh, big science. <laughs> For, for the main. Uh, so that's, uh, we'll be happy to answer questions. We're at our uh, booth over there. We have some very nice videos as well that we can show you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, first, I want to thank the lead group and Kurt specifically for inviting uh, me a chance to be here and talk to you. I'm going to try to give as much of your time back because I'm interested in listening to what you all have to say. Um, this is my first time at one of these, so we've had vapor representation at some of these in the past, and I want to learn as much as I possible, as much as I possibly can uh, today. I don't have any slides. Unfortunately, our communications department thought that our announcement last week with Blue Origin uh, was a slightly higher priority. Um, but we are excited to say that we are here to support the Artemis program for CLIPS. Um, my, myself here as a CLIPS program manager and our lead for that, as well as for Human Lander Systems for Blue Origin, as well as uh, other vendors as well. Uh, we're very excited in moving forward and supporting the science community in conjunction with all of that going forward. Uh, a little bit about Draper. We are an independent not for profit based out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. We currently have about 1,700 employees and still growing fast. We have a lot of work coming in specifically around these lunar infrastructure um, as we speak, and we're interested in hiring a lot more engineers and scientists to complement those we already have on staff. Uh, we did do the guidance computer for Apollo, so I'm confident I can say we're the only company up here that have already landed on the moon, but we're looking Sorry. forward. Yes, fair. <laughs> but we're looking forward to not being able to say that anymore. I really do think that rising tide lifts all boats and we're wishing luck to everybody here. Um, also excited to announce, or excited to, to uh, give a lot of credit to our partners that we're using for CLIPS in addition to iSpace um, out of Tokyo and General Atomics here, uh, here in the US out of San Diego, as we're already going to be launching commercial missions in 2021 and 2022. Um, which we're hoping to leverage for CLIPS payloads as well. Uh, so feel free to come by and talk to me uh, later uh, or ask questions here for, for all of us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Odit Shah from Orbit Beyond. So, and we are talking about the mid-sized lander platform that we have. It's a scalable platform. Uh, 
So it's, it's a scalable platform at its standard size. It is about, it can land about 500 kilograms to the lunar surface. It's about 2.25 meters high and we uh, can provide up to 500 watts of power on the surface. Um, going to the next slide, uh, we have a standard launch vehicle interface at the top of the lander, which allows you to mount an orbiter or a large rover like Viper. Uh, we do have ramps available to, you know, get down the rover from the top of the deck. Uh, the entire top deck, the space that you see at the bottom is available for payloads. There are also spaces available inside the lander. Uh, the same architecture can scale up to 1,000 kilograms of payload to the lunar surface. Uh, we be on track to do a launch in later, late, late half of 2022 for this lander. Thank you. All right, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, looks like about 20 minutes. If you have any questions for any of the uh, providers up here. If not, just as, oh, Amy, go ahead. Amy Fagan, Western Carolina University. Uh, so we saw a lot of uh, landers and rovers from y'all today, but yesterday there was a lot of discussion of um, a need for sample return. And I'm wondering if there's any development of robotic sample return capabilities. Yes. Can you elaborate? No. So I, I will say, just in, uh, in fairness, um, it's a competitive group. So yes and no. <laughs> um, one of the one of the benefits of a small lander is that on a large vehicle, it becomes an asset vehicle. Delta V is Delta V, and it, uh, it's fully capable of uh, making that transformation. So yes, and to some extent. Uh, so we have had multiple studies um, ongoing over the last, I think, five years to 10 years at Draper involving sample return concepts. Um, in addition to the samples that we returned some time ago, uh, from the lunar surface for an Apollo. I can also say that Draper is, has done more um, planetary entry than any other company, uh, US or otherwise. And we're leveraging and continually leveraging and growing those capabilities to go forward. And we hope to be able so, to support sample return in Eclipse type format as soon as 2023. So from- Let me, the one critical piece is to understand What's the dollar per gram of what quality back to the earth? That I'm asking the wrong audience for that. I understand that. You're the ones who want to get it. But <clears throat> you're the user. The payer is going to be NASA by and large. And until such time as they say, yes, there is a specific market, there's going to be development but I don't know what that's worth to the person paying. Um, if you don't need to require NASA money, I'm sure NASA would be more than, I'm not gonna make eye contact. I'm sure they would, be, they would love to say, yes, we can get the science without requiring NASA dollars to support it. In which case, any one of us would be more than happy to talk about that. It, we really need to know what that trade-off is in value proposition. Yeah. You, you can do a little bit of math on that, um, the sentiment, without speaking for my colleagues, is there's a, a thought that about a million dollars per kilogram landed is kind of a going rate, a little bit more, a little bit less, something like that. So the value of the sample return has to be enough that it displaces that payload value. And so that is, there's, there's what the community be willing to pay for it, there's what we can afford to displace off of our standard, just putting it in orbit or on the surface. It has to equal out to that. That's the economics of it. So to, to, offer, to offer Lockheed Martin's perspective on that, we, we do actually have a couple of sample return missions um, active right now. For example, OSIRIS-REx at Bennu, um, we have a low cost Earth return capsule for sample return. Um, it, it, for that mission. 
We've worked lunar sample return for Discovery and New Frontiers multiple times in the past. My opinion is that that really is better done in a PI-led competed mission kind of environment because sample return is not a commodity the way that mass and power and data return are. And I think it is better handled in a, um, in a mission development environment where the science team can actually lead how the mission implementation works in concert with the engineering rather than trying to procure that commercially. Elizabeth Frank, first mode. So in a traditional NASA mission, the payload and the spacecraft are designed concurrently. In this model, uh, this isn't happening, payload's coming later. Uh, so how are you managing that impact during your integration phases? So the question was, how are we managing the interface of different payloads as they're coming in? Well, just the fact that payloads are coming in. So I know you're standardizing your interfaces and saying payloads have to meet you know, all these specifications, but they're gonna be rippling impacts uh, to that model um, you know, in integration, you're going to have conflicting requirements. Oh, you're going to yeah. be dealing with that later on. So I'm wondering how you're going to mitigate that impact during your integration to meet your, your cost and schedule. So the way that this has to be done, and from, from the experience of doing that on the terrestrial side, it is set a level of service, leave some margin, and then get embedded as quickly as possible so you can iterate through whatever those challenges are. In order to, you know, this is offer of a capability. And to a certain degree, if the payload is unable to use that capability for whatever reason, what should happen in an ideal world is the next payload up should come in. And so it's a constant challenge of trying to balance how do we get a payload into work versus what level of customization? Because it's not wide open. You know, these... <laughs> These are firm fixed price, not to like, not, not going to change the dollar amount. So how do we deal with that? And each company probably has a different, slightly different answer on that. From the Mastin perspective, what we're looking to do is start that early and get as many iterations as we can in so that we can get integrated within that capability set. So from our perspective, I think you're exactly right that every instrument, even to the extent that we try to standardize the interfaces, inevitably has at least one requirement that is non-standard and unusual. Um, we've had the experience on those roughly 20 missions I showed of having integrated something like 100 different science instruments. So we kind of have in the back of our head that if somebody shows up with a mass spectrometer or a radar or something else that we need to go work these handful of things that are unique to that um, requirement. We are willing to do a fair amount of customization. So particularly if you come to us directly, uh, we are able to tailor the lander and we are able to adjust the environments or the interfaces. As was alluded to, that's not necessarily in the standard fixed price if you want a different customizable service. Um, if you go through the NASA CLIPS office, that is much more sort of standardized in order for all of the vendors to be able to compete for that. Um, I think we can still make that work as long as the instrument team really does understand what all of their requirements really are, but it is very valuable to have the engineering team and the instrument team working closely together to figure all that out. Would, would, that, would that be a paradigm, though, that it might be exciting to change? Um, just a question that if we had the equivalent of a CubeSat launcher, something very standard, uh, maybe even a, an architecture that we all adopt, and the science community could say, oh, yeah, I absolutely know I could design to that. Maybe, maybe we meet halfway. And instead of, hey, we've got unique instruments every time, and the landers have to configure around them, maybe we could say, well, if we can meet on these interfaces and figure out how to get those the right, the, maybe the right interfaces, uh, maybe the paradigm shifts where the science becomes easier because you know, oh, I could design to that, and I could test to that. And maybe I'm optimistic. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's uh, there's a potential for a transition to uh, standard service and the use of uh, CubeSat interfaces, I think, is a good example. Uh, what we're trying to do right now is just be very open and flexible and provide interfaces that people recognize, RS-422, LBDS, Ethernet, USB 2.0, USB 3.0, 802.11n, 802.11ad. 
So just standards that um, from a data interface standpoint that we everybody can comply to and a range of voltages and a kind of flexible strategy for uh, thermal where we can include blanketing or not. Uh, so that's, we, we, uh, I've had the privilege to be payload integration lead on three Mars spacecraft. We've le I've learned a lot from that uh, experience and so we're trying to bring that into our offer. Hi, I'm Yvette Gonzalez okay. from IIAS. And I wanted to just congratulate you first on CLIPS. It's been exciting to see this take a, a, a huge leap in the last year. But I know that with that comes challenges for engineering, science, and then you set a precedent for a lot of this. And in fact, I want to come back to Ms. Prem's question about precedence of culture and putting together a guideline for how do we go forward because your actions are going to be setting a precedent for the industry and the market. So when we do have questions of did we ask permission and did we have cultural relevance involved, what has been, the question wasn't actually answered, what has been the process of involving Native Americans in the conversation and was there permission granted or is there a process that's taking place now that we're not aware of? What, what is the process and what should it be in the future? You want to take that one? <laughs> I, I, I really don't have an answer. Um, it's not something, to be honest with you, that I've, that I've really thought about. Uh, I would, my expectation when I heard about that um, was that the, the people launching that payload would have uh, paid attention to those things. And if they haven't, now that awareness has been, has been raised. I don't know what they do about it now. So for those, because I know there's some that are mentioned publicly, like astrobotics and, and having the burial business that's online, what would be the steps you would take then? Because if it's being announced that that's a possibility and this is NASA funded, will you be using these payloads for that reason and will there be a process put in place? Yeah, I think in our case, um, this is a, frankly a, a new topic for us. Um, we would definitely welcome dialogue on it. We would welcome folks who uh, have thoughts on that topic uh, to have a dialogue with us directly. Um, it's, uh, it's something that I think we as an organization would uh, be glad to engage further on and learn more about, frankly, and, and listen. Pam Clark, Pam Clark JPL. Um, someone who's, who wears two hats, I don't, don't see two hats, but both lunar scientist and systems engineer, and someone who's been very much involved in the CubeSat paradigm from fairly early days, I thought I, I would comment on this business about standardization. So what you get in return, the, the reason the CubeSat paradigm is so powerful, and I don't mean they have to be shaped like cubes, just use the general paradigm. It's because there is this standardized interface. There's not a lead for extra integration, which costs money. And the idea behind the CubeSat paradigm was to create more opportunities to lower costs. Sure. You can work with experienced partners who are perfectly willing to do more work to make a one-of-a-kind interface or something that's something like the interface with some modifications, but you're going to be paying for it. So the idea was to make a, a model which we could use, which is especially powerful, not just for costs, but if you want to do multiple platforms, which I find very exciting, um, the idea that you can build something, have it standardized, build a lot of them, and it's going to really significantly lower your costs. So you don't get something for nothing. And it is something that for the last 40 years, the science community has been in the habit of thinking about one of a kind for every single, single thing. And I think in some ways that's wasteful because we certainly could use standardized interface and with a, an experienced systems engineer and payload accommodation person, I think you can usually work it out. So one of the things that when I work at JPL, one of the things I'm thinking about all the time is how you can eventually make a fairly generic yet reconfigurable in terms of the layout, but generic enough so that it doesn't cost very much, you know, it can lower costs for, for sending um, science instruments everywhere. You can comment on that or not. I just wanted to make the comment. Uh, well, maybe one, one thought when it comes to standardization. I think maybe I would offer that we're, we're still early in the market. Um, there's still opportunities for a lot of the organizations that are up here to be innovative and try new approaches. Um, I know our lander approach is, is different than others and others are different from ours. Um, so I'd hate to, uh, to have a standardization discussion um, before it's time to do that, maybe before the first mission occurs. 
um, but we certainly recognize the need for all of our interface information and uh, how you successfully integrate to be as public and as uh, widely disseminated as much as possible for the community. Um, we'd like it to be a dialogue, I think, to start. And I think naturally, as a market evolves and matures, standards will definitely take hold. But I just want to make sure that we don't uh, maybe add additional overhead to yeah. a market that's really just getting started. I agree, and I think we're running, really finding the sweet spot with how well we can apply the paradigm to science-driven or end-user requirements-driven missions. Absolutely. All right, so 10 years from now, what do you see the commercial lander or, you know, delivery to the moon uh, industry looking like? I think if any of us knew the answer for that, um, you'd see a lot more similarity in terms of the designs. Um, it's, it's really an exciting time to, to be in the industry and to help shape that. I think we all probably have our own inherent biases and in towards what we think it's going to look like, but I don't think any of us are willing to bet our respective companies on exactly what that's going to be. Well, we are. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we're all in. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, great question. Let me, let me offer two thoughts. One is the configuration of the people sitting up here will be different and you'll see, you'll see some fall by the wayside. You'll see others succeed. New people will, will, will come onto the scene. Teams will form. Teams will break apart. Uh, Sean, when you were showing some of the, the flights, I remember that it was my software flown on a Draper piece of hardware on a mast and lander in 2009. And, you know, so those people are now on different teams. So that will happen for sure. Uh, what I would like to see, and, and you kind of see glimpses of it in, the, uh, in some of the roadmap charts this morning, is I would like to see many levels of service with small landers regularly zipping around the moon with mid-scale landers delivering more sizable packages also regularly, and then a human presence that, that is, is sustained and all three of those you know tiers of service being something that is, uh, has a certain regularity to it that that's where I would like for it to go whether we can pull it off or not I don't know I would maybe offer from from our perspective um, you'd have hopefully uh, multiple lander delivery providers succeeding at that point doing regular deliveries um, but I think also you'd start to see the sort of secondary markets and secondary services starting to evolve and establish so um, you know, once you get to the lunar surface on a regular basis, a low cost, you start to need lots of power to be able to do the really exciting things um, beyond just the first few deliveries. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so then uh, I can imagine maybe power services really taking hold, but then also the first uh, hopefully demonstrations or maybe even production uh, level demonstrations of ISRU uh, happening. I mean, uh, it's difficult to say how much prospecting will definitely be needed before you can start to transition to that phase. Um, but I think there's an opportunity um, for additional services and companies to be cropping up and doing that, that ecosystem of lunar surface uh, companies, and then also international participation. So um, I'm, I'm proud that the U.S. is leading when it comes to lunar transportation services, but I think there's a, a wide opportunity for the international community to then engage in that ecosystem and provide services and other uh, science exploration activities as well. Yeah, I hope that in, in 10 years, we have a much more robust lunar exploration capability. I mean, like many of you, I've been coming to these meetings for quite a while, and it has been wonderful seeing the progress of missions like LRO and LADI, but it would sure be great to have multiple landed missions to talk about. Uh, and, and as was alluded to, I think we're going to see, hopefully, an ecosystem with a variety of providers providing both different sizes of landers and different services and capabilities. Um, I hope that there's enough demand to keep multiple competitors in the market because that drives down cost and increases innovation. I'll be a little bit surprised, honestly, if there are still nine or 12 or 15 or however many of us there are after the on-ramp um, because I, I expect that, that uh, there will be some consolidation. Um, but I, I hope that we'll see a very active lunar exploration um, ecosystem going on. The, the answer to what does it look like in 10 years, the exact architecture doesn't necessarily matter. The idea that you know, this is a wicked problem, there's a lot of different potential solutions to it. If you look at where the cities are 
where, where does human, where are human engaged? We tend to f gather around transportation nodes. That's why the East Coast has the cities that were near the coast and then other cities grew up around transportation nodes. So the answer in general is there will probably be some sort of transportation nodes. The big thing that if 10 years from now, we're going to be talking about this as it's way bigger is export. We have got to export the value of the moon outside of this room. If all we are doing is selling space capability to space people, the market is no larger and we will keep having the same thing. So the real challenge for all of us is to get out and talk to the people who are not in this room, who are not part of space, and make sure that they are looking at the opportunities that access to the moon opens up. If commercial, and I don't mean commercial providers, I mean companies that are not in the space business can create value from the lunar surface, that's when there's a lot more opportunity for us, for the providers, for the scientists, to be able to take advantage of that. That's the bet that NASA is making in the CLIPS program, that they're gonna start it out, but they're not gonna be the only ones. That's the big question of where are we in 10 years. And, and that was gonna be my follow-up to Dana's question, is in 10 years, and I'd be interested to hear, by the way, Jonathan Weinberg, Ball Aerospace, I'd be interested to hear from the rest of the panel, do you see yourselves in 10 years as being solely dependent upon a government customer, not necessarily NASA, but let's say NASA, on a government customer or being more commercial dependent, company to company? And I think that's one of the key questions that, that is of interest to know what's gonna be, wh where do you see yourselves in 10 years? Yeah, you know, I, I believe that depends to a great extent on how um, NASA leads or follows um, real space investment. Um, you've seen Elon Musk, you've seen Jeff Bezos pull ahead in many ways and take their own lane and create their own path. If, you know, one, one future is that NASA says there, there needs to be transportation nodes, the moon is a part of it, resource uh, utilization, propellant production is what's going to enable that, and NASA leads to that destination. That provides the wake in which commercialization can follow. Uh, if NASA chooses not to do that, ignores that, or doesn't see that as their role, then it's really up to um, commercial space to try to find the way I think that's a, a longer path, personally. So um, there's not enough uh, investors invest when there's a payoff. And you've got to define it, put it out there. Um, it's, I couldn't have imagined 10 years ago that we'd be on the stage talking about this, right? Uh, where we are in 10 years is anybody's guess, but it's a, a future that can be created. I'd like to follow up on that. Uh, uh, with the coming on SpaceX, we at Firefly really very much view the, co the CLIPS program being for us uh, similar to how the COST program was for SpaceX. Uh, so we think it's, it's an enabling program. Uh, it's going to help us develop this lunar capability. Uh, and then we're going to be able to use that going forward to, uh, to market that capability. OK, one final question. Thanks, Jesse. Kate Chingler from Open Lunar Foundation. It's sort of a two-part question. The first is, uh, given the wide variety of, of sort of creative uh, commercial payloads that we're starting to see emerge on uh, the CLIPS providers, and that at the moment, I presume that most of your financial support is coming from government, if perhaps a bit of academic, I'm wondering how those in the lunar community who are kind of looking to your assessments of payloads as an indication of credibility on some level, um, how, how each of you are assessing the credibility of the payloads that you're signing, signing on to your missions. And then the, the sort of 
the invitation is if you have ideas about in your fantasy, uh, what would the ideal commercial uh, customer be that would buy a ride on your, say, second or third mission? I want someone who wants to go on the second and third and fourth and fifth and once per quarter. That is where there is a real commercial market. I will tell you that Mastin focused more on slightly larger payloads. The indication of credibility of a payload at the base level is can they actually deliver? And that means deliver the payload and the check because you need both in order. I'm not sure. I would probably take the check without the payload, but I, I don't know anyone that's willing to, to but you got to have both. And for a long time, there was a lot of potential there that there was not, there was not enough customers. No matter how many customers were announced or signed up or whatever, it was never enough under the GLXP. I can tell you that it wasn't because no one closed that business case sufficiently and executed on it. And I, I, I don't mean to throw the GLXP under the, the bus, but the simple fact of the matter is I couldn't make the numbers close and I don't think other people could either. So the real question is where are the real customers and how do we assess that? And how do we balance that against the real customer? Cause let me tell you, NASA is a real customer. That's the real, real customer. And then the others that come on have to kind of be non-interfering with that. But yes, you're absolutely right. It is a challenge. The, the thing is, it's not just, finding a marketing campaign or a stunt. It's about finding a need to create value that's flying once a quarter or once a month. That's what we're looking for. What they do once they get there almost doesn't really matter to me as long as they're using us to get there. And so I think one of the advantages of the new model is that um, many of us have been, have been through the process of proposing an instrument or a mission to NASA. Well, in the new model, you don't have to persuade anybody that your instrument is worthy or is more interesting than everybody else's or is high enough TRL. You do have to have enough money in the bank to pay for it. Um, and there are, of course, ethical and legal constraints, right? So we'll, we will be checking for radio frequency interference and not disturbing Apollo landing sites and so forth. But in general, it's not really our place to judge the credibility or the merit of the customers. I think the, the clarification I'll just offer is that uh, the, the concern from the broader community that I see is that uh, there's a lot of announcements about folks signing up as customers. And what does that really mean? Does it mean that they gave, you know, 10 bucks and they promise to get back to you in six months and, you know, say they'll figure it out then? Or what kind of signal are we supposed to take when we read an announcement that says there's a new customer? Yeah, so in our case, um, we go through a pretty uh, heavy vetting process working with each customer. So before we sign a payload, um, we have a, a process in which we ensure that we'll actually be able to accommodate their plans in the first place because we don't want to uh, overpromise that our, our lander service will be able to do something incredibly exciting and then find out that the lander actually can't do that. Um, so for our own credibility, it matters to be able to go through that evaluation before we actually sign. Uh, and then once they're, they're on contract, there's a variety of deliverables and things that they have to do. Um, and so essentially you have checks all along the way uh, because we have to, of course, meet a variety of different regulations. Like, for example, we have to get our commercial launch license and we have to answer the FAA on everything that's on our spacecraft. Um, so in order for us to be a good steward, we have to ensure that our payloads are. And we have a, a highly disciplined program to ensure that that's the case. So if, if I could uh, conjure up a, a future and an ideal customer, it'd be one that's motivated by NASA saying, they want to buy propellant on the surface of the moon for uh, return to Earth and that they're um, dedicated to the proposition of buying propellant and that's going to be commercially uh, supplied and to try to, try to create a uh, gold rush or land rush or <laughs> propellant rush, water rush to uh, actually get there and, and 
put in place those uh, systems that, that can do that, starting with um, in an incremental way, but moving rapidly towards a real infrastructure of propellant production based on the moon with the idea that it's going to be used for um, NASA's purposes for greater solar system exploration. Yeah, if I could uh, add a little bit to what Sean said about a regular repeat customer. Um, a regular repeat customer that didn't take up the full manifest would be great because with the excess capacity, if you had someone who came in and said, yeah, I need four missions over this time frame." And, and they're right about the level where you'd say, you know what, with that much, we'll go ahead and stack a rocket and make plans. Then it motivates us to go beat the bushes and say, okay, uh, I've got this much time before my cutoff on new payloads, maybe I'll cut a deal with a month to go and, and, and we'll, we'll start encouraging a market because there's a, a pull. If you can get that critical mass regularly where, you know, I've got a ship, it's going, who, who wants a ride? which is a little bit different than wait and see if we win Eclipse Award, you know, so that's, that'd be a great place to be. All right, I want to thank our panelists tonight. And, uh, I want to encourage all of you or those of you that are, have further interest to visit them at their, at their um, tables tonight. I've been approached by a lot of people over the last day or two who are looking for, or I've got a capability, how do I get it, how do I get it flown, or, or these guys wondering what the needs of the scientists are, so please uh, take some time and go talk, talk with them. And uh, with that, I think we have a, a brief introduction to what's happening left, if you guys are done, if you wanna. <laughs>